Today is Friday in the fourth week of Lent 2024. Thank you for joining me in this Lenten series. Today's liturgical readings are from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 2, and John's Gospel, chapter 7, from verse 1 to verse 2, verse 10, and from verses 25 to 30. I'm going to be sharing with you today on the danger of dogmatism. Danger of dogmatism. Listen to these words from today's text of John's Gospel. So some of the inhabitants of Jerusalem said, Is he not the one they are trying to kill? And look, he's speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Could the authorities have realized that he is the Messiah? But we know where he is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. My dear brothers and sisters, the Jewish authorities were determined to get rid of Jesus because the issue of his real identity had become a thorny one for them to handle. His teachings exposed their lack of fundamental understanding of the scriptures and his miracles had become a source of humiliation to their religious formalism and rigidity. On their part, the inhabitants of Jerusalem were simply dazzled, amazed, and confused. In their confusion, they were beginning to ask each other, is there something the rulers know that they are not telling us? Is there something they know that we don't know? They've been looking for an opportunity to arrest and to kill this fellow because they say he's an imposter. But do they have evidence that proves that he is the Messiah? Is that why they are now allowing him to speak openly and publicly? They were confused. And they were beginning to come to a conclusion based upon what they had seen and what they had heard. Some of them were beginning to lean towards uh, 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 accepting Jesus as the Messiah. But for some others, as soon as the thought came up, they hurriedly dismissed it. And so, it became an opportunity for them, even though they had an opportunity to reconsider the things that they had learned, they turned it down. In verse 27, we learn why they quickly answered their own questions and they changed their minds. In their minds, Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because they knew where he was from. At least they thought they knew where he was from. They surmised that Jesus was born in Nazareth because that's where he grew up. But they didn't realize, nor did they know or care to know that he was actually born in Bethlehem in fulfillment of the prophecy of Micah in chapter 5, verse 2. Little did they know that by saying these words about Jesus, they were also actually fulfilling prophecy. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 53, verse 3, he was spurned and avoided by men, a man of suffering, knowing pain, like one from whom you turn your face, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. In their reaction to Jesus, they too were fulfilling prophecy. Now, in contending that they knew where Jesus was from, they were actually now going back to what they had been taught concerning the physical birthplace of the Messiah. They were also referring to the way that the Messiah was supposed to appear on the scene as they 
had been taught by the rabbis. The rabbis had been teaching over time that the Messiah would suddenly make himself known without warning. He would suddenly appear on the scene. That was a popular belief at the time of Jesus and that his ancestry would not be known. In fact, many of them believed that the Messiah himself would not know that he was the Messiah. He would not know where he was from. According to these popular beliefs and teachings of the rabbis, the Messiah would not know his own identity until the prophet Elijah suddenly appears and anoints him and empowers him. So suddenness, that element of suddenness was key to their beliefs concerning the coming of the Messiah. Yet, all of these were in spite of the prophecies of scriptures. All of these, none of these was scriptural. But the life of Jesus, his birth, his words, his miracles, his life, all of these were already fulfillment of well-documented scriptures. Yet the people of Jerusalem, the rulers of the people, would rather stick to their traditions, their speculations that were not found in the scriptures. They were just being unnecessarily dogmatic. This was dogmatism at its, at its worst. Now, obviously, Jesus knows what they were saying about him because he cries out with a loud voice in the temple area in verse 28, saying, the text says, So Jesus cried out in the temple area as he was teaching and said, You know me and also know where I am from. Yet, I did not come on my own, but the one who sent me, whom you do not know, is true. Now, hold on right there. Just a moment. Just a moment. Did Jesus just say, you know me, and you know where I am from? Was Jesus agreeing with what they were saying about him and about where he is from? Why would Jesus say that? Is there any truth to what they were saying about him? Or was he just being sarcastic? Apparently, apparently, this has to be a part of his plan to direct the conversation himself. After all, he did grow up in Nazareth as a son of Mary and Joseph. That's all that these leaders know about him. And that's all they care to know about him. So rather than argue with them about his human origin, Jesus takes the conversation to a whole new level. He reminds them of his heavenly origin and mission. So there's more to this story than just human geography. Before he was born, he was sent. That makes him greater than all of the prophets who were called by God and sent by God at a specific time in history and a specific time in their lives with a specific message. Whereas Jesus was sent even before he was born. So what we have here what we find here is Jesus adjusting the focus of the people's attention. 
moving it away from himself and placing it upon the sender, upon his father, upon God. They know, these hearers know that he's talking about God because he had used such words before. He describes his heavenly father with these words, he who sent me is true. Would that not be obvious to his listeners who sent him? The scriptures describe God as being eternal and unchanging. But the word true in this instance has a different meaning. Jesus is saying that the one who sent him is real. He's authentic. He's genuine. He's trustworthy. He's worthy of being believed. And that he can be known personally and intimately. He is worthy of genuine worship and wholehearted obedience. That is what he was talking about when he said he is true. Now this revelation about God being true is followed by a rebuke. After describing the father who sent him, Jesus looks around them and then he says to them, whom you do not know. You do not know him. And he has made that statement in times past. And here he is saying it again, that they, they did not know him because they do not recognize him as their Messiah. You cannot know one without the other. You cannot know the sender without the one that he had sent. And you cannot know the one that he has sent without knowing the sender. Both of them are inseparable. In verse 29, Jesus says, I know him because I am from him and he sent me. I know him, that is knowledge. I am from him, that is his origin. He sent me, that is his mission. So all of these constitute a strong foundation for his identity as the Messiah, as the Son of God. You see, my brothers and sisters, the Jewish rulers had so much information and misinformation about God and the Messiah, but they never really, they never really knew him. Of course, there's a great difference between knowing God and simply knowing about God. Millions of people know about God, but they do not really know him. There is a theoretical and an experiential knowledge of God. And it is this experiential knowledge of God that is so vital. In writing to the Philippians in chapter 3, St. Paul said, to know Christ was the one thing that he desired above all else. To know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, isn't that amazing? Could you and I, say that our lives are reduced to one single irreducible minimum? If somebody approached you and said to you, what is the most important thing in your life? What is your life all about? Will you be able to answer this one thing I do? Or would you rather say, well, I've got like 10 things on my list. I mean, it, it, it's just simply amazing to be able to say, in my life, there is just one thing, one thing that is profoundly important. One thing. And that is my Christian experience of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. This one thing I do. And guess what? This is what the whole season of Lent invites us to. 
that we may know God and the Christ that he has sent. Question is, do you know him? Are you interested in knowing him? Is knowing him a priority in your life? Is that the one thing you really desire? Or are you still busy chasing other things without knowing him? The lack of knowledge of the rulers and the people of Jerusalem was what led to their betraying, arresting, and getting him killed. Lack of knowledge is self-destructive. I pray that you and I will know him better so that we can love him more intimately and serve him with even more passion in the days and the years to come through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.